everyone, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sails podcast for a very special Patreon exclusive commentary track. I am Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. And we are doing episode two of season one now. We, we started and <laughs> we're still just very excited to do this. We're going to be doing this for ages, and I'm I so happy we didn't about think it. Think of this earlier, really. It's like, how did we not just decide to sit down and do commentary tracks together? Because we really so barely got so to watch fun. any together at all. Yep. So this is great. So we're going to do episode two now. And uh, I have no idea when episode three will drop, but we'll just keep doing this because it's fun for us. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, So yeah, so I did actually, maybe I should have asked on Patreon, maybe next, next for maybe for episode three, I'll ask on Patreon. I did actually solicit on Twitter um, if anyone had any questions for us specifically about this episode. We do have one and we're going to save that till the end after we do the commentary and we should say for this and all of the commentary tracks we are we are allowing ourselves to talk about the whole show yes. and bring pull pull ideas from all four seasons when we talk about this so so definitely if you have not watched all of the show pause <laughs> watch all the show and then come back and you can do these uh commentary tracks with us because we are having a lot of fun absolutely All right. So what we want everyone to do now is just like we do with our live tweets is queue up to the place where it says Toby Stevens during the at the beginning of the um, opening credits. Mm -hmm. And we will tell you when to press play. All right. So everyone be queued up to where it says Toby Stevens, our dear captain. Mm -hmm. And now in three, two, one, play. Aye, aye, captain. I like that we get to do the opening credits every time when we do this, because I never, still, so many watches, so many years. And there's so much there. Not tired of it. No, it's true. I finally Um, watched Game of Thrones, which is probably the only thing that I think has a similar uh, depth and storytelling going on in the opening credits. So, but I have to say, I like this one better. I do too. I absolutely like this one better. It's gorgeous. Plus, we get that good, good Bear McCreary. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, this is an inter- Like, this is one topic that we never asked in any of the interviews that I'm planning on asking for the book is I really want to talk about how these credits came about. Yes. I love all the light and darkness and also how much like rage we see on what should be like the light side, the right side. They do a really great job of showing we are all villains in the story. (laughs) Right, right. No, that's a really interesting observation about it. I also I love that it that it gives us the sense of the story of the show Mm -hmm. without being a literal thing at all. I think we I said I think we talked about that in our last commentary track. Sorry, everyone, if we repeat ourselves. (laughs) All right, here we go. Episode two. I love this episode. I have to say straight up, I love this episode so much. It's been a long time for me to have rewatched all of these, so I'm excited to just watch it unfold. I thought about watching it in advance to have things to say, but I decided it would be more interesting to just go with it. There you see, you see Eleanor has her, her bruise. Yes, she sure does. Fun fact, I actually have the earrings that Hannah New is wearing here. <laughs> you do I have do. those earrings. I actually, when I was watching this recently, I thought about uh-huh. that, that those are exactly the earrings you mm-hmm. have. I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. They did the eBay auction and a very generous, lovely listener won them and then sent them to me because she's a terrific human. And I was actually visiting you when they arrived. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And a little bit of pirate <laughs> duty too. So pretty nice. I love this. I love that we established straight up like how invested Eleanor is yes. in NASA. Yeah, she does have a real relationship with the island. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I'm just fascinated by these sets. They are so perfect and gorgeous. Hmm. Look how concerned Max is about 
Eleanor's worries there. Max really is the most empathetic, just the best of all the characters when it comes to just relating to other people. Mm hmm. And this is deftly done, too. This is a lot of exposition to dump on everybody in episode two, but yep. they're doing it really beautifully. Right, because it's really doing, it's explaining to us the things that we're supposed to worry right. about, and it's also showing us so much about Eleanor at the exactly. same time. As long as you do that in character, you can get away with dumping a lot of exposition on people. But as soon as it just feels speechy or like right. someone's, you know, reading from a textbook, then you lose that completely. Yep. So I wrote my essay about this episode already mm -hmm. for the book. And the the thing that I found really interesting is that I really focused on Eleanor in this one. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I found interesting is that Eleanor gets three offers. Speaking of offers. In this. Sorry. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> also that also. offer. <laughs> I'm not really... <laughs> Sorry, Daphne, okay. you were saying something intelligent and insightful <laughs> and deep into the lore. And I'm just like, ooh, sex, though. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> so Eleanor, Eleanor gets three offers. I'm not counting that uh -huh. one. But Eleanor gets three offers in this episode. And I feel like that's kind of the structure of it. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in this mm -hmm. episode. I think back when we were podcasting, this was the episode that I called um, Smart Pirates Being yes. Smart. Yes, uh-huh, absolutely. Or Smart um, Pirates Outsmarting Other Smart Pirates. Yes, yeah. something that was um, a mouthful but, of words. <laughs> right. Well, because, yeah, and this episode's really fun because it's a caper episode. Yes. Like, we have oh, that's this a great whole point. thing. But, but what the structure of it, for me, is all about Eleanor and the choices Eleanor is going to need to make. Mm -hmm. Like that's really the, the, like the main thing that's happening here is that Eleanor needs to make a huge choice. Absolutely. That's going to affect everyone. And I think it's really interesting. The three offers she gets. So I will yeah, point do them point out, them them out they as happen. they come along. The cinematography on this episode is luminous by the way. Yeah. I love that we go straight back into Billy's dilemma. Mm -hmm. like we go straight back to Billy dealing with what he just did. Yep. Look at him. It's an interesting shot of uh, Tom Hopper looking small there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't see that very often. Which is perfect. It's perfect. Which is it's so perfect, perfect right? No, it's wonderful. He's such a good choice. so overwhelmed mm -hmm. with what he just did. And like we saw that in the last episode, but this episode really brings it home. Just the beginning of the moral implications for Billy of the choice he just mm -hmm. made. And there's your Randall. I know. <laughs> I do love, I love what they do with Randall here because he really does. He shows, he shows in two different ways how things can be read in different ways. Yes. Each time he talks to a character, that character is like, wait a minute, are you talking about me? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, I and love how I when think... we first went through this show, you talked about him as a Greek oracle and that yep. he says, whatever he says is so kind of like mystical that you can kind of pull from it, whatever it is that you're thinking at the time or the characters do rather. Right, exactly. Because mm -hmm. it's got that kind of ominous feeling to it, but also this vagueness. Yes, like a horoscope. Mm -hmm. I love the feather detail. Yes. Such good spy craft. <laughs> and I love these three men in this room. Mm. Yeah. All searched. Except. Well. Oh, imagine that. This is uh, this is actually our first our first moment of being underestimated as a gift. Oh, I mean, that's it's not right. Yet. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. This Absolutely. is that's really a, a being underestimated as a gift. And like Silver leverages the shit out of that concept. He never says it like Jack does, but he leverages that idea. You're so right. Constantly. Yeah. I mean, this I think I, I feel like Silver. that's kind of embedded 
What? No, I'm just alarmed. It's such early silver and props yeah. to Luke Arnold because you can see him like figuring things out and getting smarter. Like you can see him learning. It's right. It's gorgeous. Yep. Yeah, I mean that's part of where the whole smart pirates being mm-hmm. smart. <laughs> like yep. it really this is this is a great episode for that. Episode 5 then becomes another episode talking about learning and you know outsmarting people mm-hmm. and oh god, now oh, we have the, the belly, belly flop. flop. Oof. I love that it's fucking so belly good. flop. It's so Thank good. you stuntman. <laughs> good day's work. <laughs> Ooh. Oh man, I don't know. There is no way to do that belly flop without There's, really yeah, hurting no, yourself. Yeah, no, you just got to take one for the team at that point, right? Just hope they pay you well. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I love all these shots where they've got the water there in the bottom third. Just gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... This isn't where I thought I realized it, but can I just make a point can that I just, just made on Twitter? That's, yes. Can I just say? <laughs> okay, I'm going to like just interrupt what's going on here for a second. Mm-hmm. to like. So remember when we talked to Hannah and she told us about her whole like backstory she yes. had for the birdcage in Eleanor's mm-hmm. room? Right? So Eleanor has an empty birdcage, which is a symbol for Hannah of like their of her mother feeling caged and that they were brought to NASA. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you just noticed. They were everywhere in that tree. The brothel, I sure did. Yeah. The brothel is chock-a-block bird cages with birds in them. Oh, God, that's gorgeous. I just realized that when I was, when I was working on episode five and I was just like, fuck, I can't yeah. believe it. Like we have an empty bird cage representing Eleanor and the brothel is so many birds in their cages Mm -hmm. so you have both the whole like concept of caged or uncaged Mm -hmm. but also the fact of loneliness versus communalism wow yep that like blew me away i had this moment where i was like oh my god there's birds in cages everywhere in this place (laughs) and snakes don't forget (laughs) yeah i cannot believe it i just i can't believe it took me that years to Mm -hmm. notice that the show that keeps on giving yeah it really does (laughs) thank you black sales are always giving me new things to like obsess about (laughs) oh jack i'm so really thankful for this episode yeah because we actually start getting some jack Jack. like yep it's still like he still feels underutilized to me at this yeah. point. Like, I just get, it's like, but every episode we get more Jack. And I mean, of course, Jack's a central part of the story here, mm-hmm. but he's not yet the Jack that, you know. That we come to know and love. Yep. Mm-hmm. Next episode, we get a lot of Jack. Yeah, he hasn't quite found his footing yet, I think, as a character. Right. Still trying to impress Charles Vane here. He's so excited. Look at him. <laughs> I know. I know. And I love this because they're really both showing their their separate different intelligences mm-hmm. here, like throughout this episode. Because like, look at the what Jack's doing is really smart. Sorry. Oh, no, no, not at all. What Jack's doing is really smart. And what Vane's saying is also really mm-hmm. smart. It's just like, seriously, dude? No, they make a great team. They come from things at such different angles. Mm -hmm. They're both right. I mean, this is, Mm -hmm. you know, these are my favorite scenes where everyone's right. And yet they're still in conflict. Yes. Yes. Such smart writing. Ballsy, Jack. God, these three. See, and Vane concedes because he thinks that Singleton, like the whole Singleton thing worked out still. Oh, yeah. Good point. Oh, Kings. Yep. (laughs) I love 
<laughs> so, like they're like they're like fast speed chase, but really slow. He's just like I'm watching you, and we're just both really moving really slowly, but you're still behind me. Uh-huh. <laughs> God, that ocean water is just gorgeous. Mm-hmm. See, we're in a rush right now, mm-hmm. so we don't get the like special shot of Boots going in water, which is like the, the signature Black yes. Sails thing of like, <laughs> let's watch Boots splash into water. I mean, but not? we don't get that right now because we're in a rush. Yep. We got things to do right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I love you, Gates. <laughs> All in a day's work. Yep. This is so important that okay. she pays for Max. I think that that's right. just so important. Well, and she pays for Max, but she also pays to have Max exclusively. Right. I mean, okay, not completely exclusively, but exclusively in a certain in way. A cer- yeah. I mean, wherever she draws the lines, she's the madam, the boss. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I think in the podcast, we really focused on how that shows that that the limitations of the relationship, but yeah. it also shows how Eleanor makes herself alone. Makes herself because alone? The fl- because the flip side of not, of not allowing the other person intimacy to yourself is you're not allowing yourself the openness of that intimacy. So that really isolates Eleanor for herself like if she doesn't let anyone in then she'll always be alone oh i hear what you're saying yeah but by keeping max at arm's length in that way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because i think the scene you know the scene coming up is going to show how how important max is actually to eleanor even when eleanor rejects her Mm -hmm. so that shows us that eleanor has always been alone but also kept herself alone yes. no i think that's very strong and helps explain her and her relationship with vane too who i'm sure in right. many ways is unavailable right See, this is also kind of crudeness from Eleanor, but I love the shit out of yeah. this. No, this is good. scene. Yeah, the ever since I p- sprouted mm-hmm. tits is brilliant. Yeah, no, this one works for me much better than her mm-hmm. entrance scene does. Right? If if, if this exactly. had been the first scene with her, I think I would have. Oh my god! Yeah, this is a first everything. scene. <gasps> Because this scene is brilliant. Yep. This sh- this scene allows her to be crude, but in crude in response to his insults. Exactly. Which is so different. Which mm-hmm. makes her playing him instead of her just like being... God, I, I love that line. Mm-hmm. I seriously love that line. Because <laughs> it's an amazing fuck you to him using his own awful language yes. against him. Yes. Yeah. So this this is the big this is the beginning of Vane's offer. Yeah. This is him proving himself to as a prelude to the offer he's about to make. Mm-hmm. In so many ways, when I think about the show, this is how I remember the introduction of Vane. Even More though so than se- we than meet the him episode in one. one, like yep. we we're in episode one, right? right. We meet him there, and yep. it's great. Like I love again. I love it when he punches Eleanor in the face. And I'm not supposed to love it, but it's just a great moment narratively. <laughs> it's just like their whole No, but I agree gorgeous. with you. I feel so like this, this like is Vane's true Vane. introduction. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting because Vane's introduction then is Vane in relation to Eleanor, which I think is very appropriate. Yes. Because I don't think there is a moment in this show where Vane isn't... Oh, he identifies Eleanor himself isn't present. in relation to Eleanor, yes. Right, exactly. I don't think even in season three, I don't think there's a moment of this show where Vane 
where Eleanor isn't occupying some portion of his mind when he's making his choices. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of Max as well for most of the show. I think that Eleanor is a constant for both of them. He's gorgeously vulnerable in this scene. Mm Mm-hmm. And whoever is lighting this knows exactly what to do with his eyes. No, sit right here. Yeah, right here. For real. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Jesus. I love how we give her all this height in that throne like chair. Mm-hmm. And he's down and he's that, been hunched over. That he's fucking chair, huh? Smaller. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wow, that fucking chair is gorgeous, though. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it you who started noticing the chairs early on? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I love love Flint's season two chair. Mm -hmm. So we had the great introduction of Vane's crew abusing... I mean, great introduction. But, you know, we had the appropriate introduction of Vane's crew being abuse, abusive to one of the prostitutes that we saw, you know, that could be something that you just saw in passing when Eleanor leaves the brothel, but it becomes important. Right. And that relates back to what Eleanor said in the very beginning to Max, where she talked about them living like animals and fucking in tents. Mm-hmm. Vane represents what she sees as the past of NASA that's that right. she's trying yeah, to she's trying walk to away from. from. That's a great point. Right. So this is the first offer. Basically, Vane's offer to her is like, I'll be your strong man. So that, but he, what he's offering her is NASA as it has been. Right. A so that's of offer number one. Yeah, that's great. Right. So that's the first of the three offers. I like their relationship very much. I do too. It has its ups and downs. It does. <laughs> you don't say. But I love, I love that in season four we had this to remind us. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I season, four, like their interactions in season four work because we have this wonderful foundation of it. Okay. <laughs> Our listeners love this scene. This like love laughing. this moment like... for for different reasons than I love it. I mean, I love it too. I don't know how you feel about it now. Definitely when we podcasted, you were like, I don't love this scene. I love that it has become... I, I, it's like the thing that people quote. I don't know how to put it exactly. It's like... It's right. Like, no, people quote it. A lot of our listeners put a lot of weight into it. I mean, I can see what they're saying. Like, this is about this is about the idea of truth and that truth is, you know, a story. A story is true. A story is not true. Like, oh. this, this idea that, that, like... That it's not subjective? No, that it's actually completely subjective. That two people can look at this, at these two paintings, and one will be like, they're exactly the same. And the other person will be like, what? Are you crazy? <laughs> There's absolutely no similarity uh, interesting. here. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. But this is what I love in this scene. Every, yeah. Everyone focuses on what Fraser's saying. I love this. I love when... I love when Gates says, I love this town. Like that's what is meaningful to me here. Because for me, this is all about home and what Nassau means to different people. And Gates is the person who is of this place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does fit in in a really lovely way. Exactly. And I feel like, you know, the kind of crux of this episode is like, what was NASA and what should NASA be? Mm -hmm. And Gates represents this like, this like fulcrum point where he, he like, 
he has the ability to go along with the vision for the future, but he also accepts it for what it yes. is. And that is what allows him to be the smart one in the caper. When everyone else is running around doing shit, he's just like, let me sit and like enjoy myself and enjoy the absurdity of this thing that going on on the street. Mm -hmm. Because I get NASA enough that I even know how to, I know how to win this game without even driving myself right. crazy. Yeah, like, that right here, sure. there he goes. Mm -hmm. He's like, I I knew what I needed to do. I needed to just watch the appraiser. <laughs> just like that. See? He's just like, yep, y'all were racing around doing crazy shit, but I just sat there. <laughs> and I'm the one who wins. Yep. I mean, that's the thing. Like, Gates knew what to do. So it's like veins almost representing the past of NASA. Mm -hmm. Flint is about to represent the future of NASA or a future, yeah. a potential future. And Gates kind of is He's NASA. firmly in the present. Yeah. No, I love right. that. That's, that's beautiful. That's a great analogy. But Gates exists in this world where he understands the past and is willing to go with Flint into the future. Mm -hmm. That's what's interesting about him right there. Like he knows everything. Like Billy doesn't even understand. Like Billy's about to question what, mm -hmm. what Fraser is going to go do. But Gates is like, yeah, I know everything that's going on just based on what I see. This set is so incredible. I know. I love it. Yeah, they, it feels like it's been here for 50 years. It's just. I love it so much. God, it's so fucking perfect. Gorgeous. See, and Gates is like, yep, that is definitely not him going for sex. Cause Ann Bonnie's yep. there. <laughs> Seriously, who would like to have sex while Anne Bonnie is like Skulking outside with outside her? The door. <laughs> <laughs> That's just not going to be relaxing and True. fun. <laughs> Black pearls. Oh god! Mm. Like Max's confidence here just mm -hmm. slays me. When you know what's going to happen, it's so hard to watch yeah. how confident she is. And this is where we still see how impressed Jack is with her before they have like their tensions, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. where he's still like, hello, <laughs> which again is establishing really important stuff that will pay off later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now Eleanor is getting offer number two. Oh yeah. All right. Vane did offer number one. Flint's about to do offer number two. God, that man is so good at playing the role he needs to play to to motivate people. You know, like Scott's like just being rational. Eleanor's losing it, mm -hmm. you can see. And Flint's like, I'm just going to be chill because <laughs> what I need right now is to be chill. No, but there's interesting. There's a moment that shifts. Let me, I'll point that out when it happens. There's a moment of a shift in, in Flint's demeanor that's fascinating to me. Right? Uh, let me, yeah. let me tell you about a story about a, about a Spaniard named Vasquez. This is his, this is his performative thing that he knows how to do, right? Mm -hmm. He, or we saw this already. We saw this last episode. We saw him say those exact same words. So that's his performance. And in a minute, we're going to talk about when Flint goes to a different place than his performative storytelling. Mm -hmm. I have a theory about this. Look at these two. They're just like, I know they're just like, they're just like deal making and planning and plotting is just so sexy. It is. It's very fun. Yeah. <laughs> Until Vane shows mm -hmm. up, makes it m so much less sexy. I don't know. Vane's pretty sexy. No, no. Vane's very <laughs> sexy, but he's just like, he's just like, he's like, really? Sex is not about plotting. Like yeah, these no, two love plotting as, as flirtation. Uh -huh. And Vane's like, <laughs> fuck that. Yeah. You and your plotting, not so sexy for me. Not for him. Nope. <laughs> that is not, that is not the kind of thing. 
that turns Vane on. <laughs> See, look at how she keeps talking to Jack. Mm-hmm. She knows who she needs to talk to. God, her resilience. Yeah. We already see her resilience. Look how strong she is. Okay, that, I love that. Okay, can I just point out uh-huh. about Adele, Adele and Blades? Yes. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes, you may. Like, the payoff is so many episodes away, <laughs> but I love that Adele starts with a blade mm-hmm. and then goes on to a different kind of blade later on. You can see how concerned Jack is about Max here. I know. He's trying to hide it, but he's so nervous. Right. And what he's saying is so smart. Yeah. And it's saying like, like yeah, he doesn't even that. care, but he cares very much. See, look at that. Ah, gorgeous. Hmm. Mm, very impressive. This completely impossible thing that Jack does, but it's fine. Whatever. I know. Whatever. 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 It's a I, love show. It. I love it. <laughs> also, not sure how Silver gets away that quickly. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I don't care. This is really fun. Fun TV. I love this. I'm in. It's like Ocean's Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> but pirates. But pirates. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes it better. Absolutely, it does. <laughs> I love that you loved Vane already the first time you watched this at this point. I was just like, he's scary and I don't like him. I don't know why. I don't know what it was. I just, I just, yep. I, I just know. liked him from the beginning. Okay. All right. Okay, watch this now. Okay, so now Flint's being super practical, right? Mm -hmm. He's like two in his Urcadilima Vasquez story thing still. Why return it all to NASA? Watch this. Now he's doing the story he did for Billy. But watch his eyes now. Look how he's unfocused suddenly. Mm -hmm. He's like retreating into himself suddenly. He's no longer looking at her even. And he's not being nonchalant in a performative way. Now he's talking to himself. Hmm. See, now he's brought out of that for a second because of Scott. So this is his need for personal freedom, for independence from... This is this is his need for land. He needs he's looking outside of himself. He's looking for again, we'll learn later on that he's looking for a dream that's been handed to him that he has clung to. Yes. So he's now he's still you see he's looking at them again. He's talking to them right. and he's about to retreat again back into himself. Men starved of hope. Mm. There we go. Why here? Hmm. Now watch Eleanor's face. See, he's not looking at her again. He's now retreated back into himself and what is actually moves him. We're learning so much about Flint right here. Here we go, the ore for a shovel. Mm, So good. And watch Eleanor. Look at her. And do you see how the wind picks up? I love that this moment of like, right, exactly, the magic. This is the moment where Eleanor realized that Flint is not just, she's understanding now why she always was inspired by Mm -hmm. him. In this moment, 
he's offering her exactly the thing that she knew she wanted, but she didn't quite have the words Mm -hmm. for. Like she articulated something very similar in the beginning of this episode about wanting to move NASA from a place where people were living like animals and fucking in tents. Mm -hmm. So she knew that she wanted to get away from that, but she didn't know what to go towards. Right. No, that's a good point. And Flint just handed that to her. Hmm. Sure seeing her so that was working. the right. That was the second offer. The second offer was him say him articulating the thing. I believe that was deep down in her heart all along, but she didn't know exactly what it looked like mm. yet. He gave her that vision. I love Adele tending to Max. Mm, I know, right? Yeah. They established their relationship so mm-hmm. early on. So that's it. She got the second offer. Now she's about to get the third offer. Shit. Yep. Right. So there is a possibility that had Eleanor not just had the Odysseus conversation with Flint or listened to Flint talk about Odysseus, that this would have all gone very differently. Like she is riding right now on the inspiration of hearing that story from Flint. Yeah. Mm hmm. Right? So now's the third offer. The third offer is based in their relationship. Mm -hmm. Again, we have a moment where everyone's speaking the truth, but they can't reconcile Mm -hmm. their two truths. God, this kills me. <laughs> this, is, this will never be easy for me to watch, yeah. ever. I've watched it so many times and it still breaks my heart. Ugh. And there was only ever right. one way Look they at, could go for Eleanor. She did. She had orchestrated everything and had everybody here already. Right, right. She was hoping that Max would give it to her freely, but if she didn't... Yep. In truth, though, what kind of life could these two women start together in this time, in this place? I think, right. I think we fantasized about that to some extent just because they're both so smart and resourceful. Mm -hmm. But yes, you're right. That is true. But on the flip side, you have to look at the reality. You know, you have to look at the feasibility of what Flint is offering her as well. And that's, I mean, I guess that is ultimately the greatest metaphor for women of that time is that Flint is offering basically she got Eleanor got three offers and none of them will ever truly serve her Mm. Vane offered her NASA which she knows won't last forever it is made of sand Mm -hmm. Max offered her running away to be in love and be part of you know to be her sure internal self and but that also not so feasible. Any, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Flint has offered her this idea of trading a shovel for an oar, which seems very inspiring, but will we have to see, you know, in future episodes how feasible that is. And, you know, anyone who's watched the show knows. <laughs> Doesn't end so good. <laughs> that, that's not going to go so well either. So, like, that's it. I mean, ultimately, this whole episode... The crux on which this whole episode sits is Eleanor needing to choose one of these three options mm-hmm. and none of them would actually lead to a happy, good life. Would serve her. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Right. Mm. God, 
it's so beautiful it to look at this. It is just so gorgeously shot. Mm -hmm. I feel like the location of the wrecks mm -hmm. changes from season to season, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I really like the season one location. I feel like, you know, in season four, we have a much like less mountainous, yeah. like less rocky. It's very rocky. I like that. Which makes yeah, sense for the wrecks, exactly. Right? Yeah. It's very dramatic. Mm -hmm. I love that he's like, are you frightened, Jack? But what ultimately is Jack's downfall is the fact that he's really so frightened. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so afraid. Um. This is this is great. This is a great end to a caper episode. Mm -hmm. It's just like we're all in one place. It's dark. It's creepy. And no one expects this little move here from nope. either side. And that's it's so important. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, yeah, back in I remember in the podcast, what we talked about was like people who are strategically smart and then you know when <laughs> when your strategy comes up against charles Maine, yes. you're just willing to kill yes yeah which is great because that's like that's those are the two elements of what's important about a pirate story ultimately it's like they had to all be smart and strategic but they also had to be willing to be brutal yeah, they had to be ruthless so true and that's the balance there's always the balance between those two things. Oh, God, yep. that is so brilliant. Jack reasoning with him, rationalizing, being like, the other yep. guy's got a little lever. It's like, in this situation, we just simply can't. Boom. <laughs> you were saying, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Fuck you, Jack. Vane's, Vane's kind of the Yoda in this moment. Like, there is no try. There is do or do not. <laughs> like fuck all your talk <laughs> i'm just gonna do something yeah. now thank you very much <laughs> i have an answer i have an answer to your dilemma exactly. let me just pull out my knife right now <laughs> Here comes but you're right one. i mean it really yeah, makes it really makes jack and charles such a great partnership how did this guy get his courage? Like, seriously? Right? I know. I mean, I guess if you're that hard up and you just get... I mean, if you offer some girl or whatever. <laughs> or, or or the story just needs for a dude to do that right Or, now. yes. <laughs> there is the that. Third act and... <laughs> oh, and here's Billy. Yep. Yeah, I love it. You're I right. love it. Classic caper. So good. So much fun. Yeah. Everybody after the same thing. Our desperate guy. I just, I just, I just, I love this show. I love mm -hmm. that we can have this with this music and them all running around over the wrecks uh -huh. or the rocks of the wrecks right after we had this unbelievably beautiful emotional, emotional scene, scene between uh -huh. Max and Eleanor. I love the shoot. This show can do both. Yes. Like, it's just incredible. Yeah. And it does like the big bombastic, the storm episode and all of the battle scenes right. are just gorgeous. And then all those small, subtle emotional moments are handled with such beauty and grace. Right. And it just, it feels like the same story. Uh -huh. I mean, it just all yeah. works together. No, you're absolutely right. And you don't get those weird episodes where you're like, who's the odd guest director they pulled in this week? You know, it's right. just like, yep. what show is this today? It's very no, cohesive. This show, this show always has purpose. Mm -hmm. Again, season one, not as strong, but even so, season one still Pretty has damn purpose. damn good. Smart people solving problems. Yep. That's always going to be fun. Mm -hmm. That is a lot to memorize. Really I am is. sorry. That in, is a lot to memorize. Is it in Spanish too? Or is it not? 
I have no idea. Maybe. Yeah, I, it's certainly a lot to memorize either way. Under a lot of stress. Now, granted, he's probably been kind of pouring over it for a while. So Right. And he does make that point yes. in a later episode. That's right. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he was, he had looked at it before because he was trying to figure out what the fuck it is. Yeah. No, that's a good point, too. And then once he figured out what it was, whoa. Right. Oh, Jack. <laughs> oh, dear Jack. That's just really sad. Yeah. <laughs> it just always pains yeah. me to watch all those no. pearls float away. Oh. I know. Oh. This is going to this is going to cost him so a lot. Bad. A lot of people peeing on him. Yep. Ah, <laughs> oh, that sucks. <laughs> the first time I saw this episode, this was so exciting, but I had started the first episode and loved it so much that I poured right into the second one. So it's like one o'clock in the morning and I'm so tired and everything's so dark. I'm like, stay awake. It's so interesting. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is, this is a lot of episode to absorb when you're really it tired. Is. Yeah. There's so much happening. Ah. Uh... Silver, you're so smart. Mm -hmm. I love Silver. Hmm. So I just would like to point out that this is when Max chooses to leave NASA, but she doesn't end up leaving NASA. Mm -hmm. And then Max only leaves NASA in season four. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. She can never escape NASA. Of course. Yeah. See, and again, Adele being a good friend. I love Adele. She's such Adele a strong too. character. She does so she's, much in the series. She's one, yeah, she's one of the characters that I'm so curious if, like, just the way that Lisa played her just ended up making her more important in the show than she oh, was sure. ever, than was ever their plan. That's what I suspect. I've never, I've never asked specifically, but I just have that feeling that, like, Adele's, like, there. She's a named character mm -hmm. from the beginning, but but it just feels like just the strength of Lisa's performance mm -hmm. must have something to do with. Okay. So here is when we have. Mm. So I also want to point out that Eleanor in season one was drinking and Max stopped her so that they could connect with each other and Max could oh, help her. And yes. now Eleanor is drinking alone. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And looking pretty dejected. Yeah. Oh, he's pissed at you too. Nobody likes you right now, Eleanor. Oh, that's hard. Okay, and we have in the background, this is actually before Outlander ever started, but we have the Skyboat oh, song sky in the song background. Oh, this is the Skyboat song, which we, anyone who's also a fan of Outlander, like me, um, is aware that Bear McCreary loves the Skyboat mm -hmm. song, but the Skyboat song feels so appropriate here. 
I only found out afterwards that the sky there is the version of the sky boat song that is so many different versions. Yes, (laughs) there are, and yet the version that shows up in Outlander Uh is the version that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote of the sky boat song, and the version that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote is a song of longing for a lost home. It is a song about. It is a song about longing for home mm-hmm. and being displaced, which I feel like is completely so appropriate for for Eleanor's story here mm-hmm. because Eleanor chose Flint's dream of creating a someday home mm-hmm. in Nassau or in New Providence Island more accurately. She chose that over the alternate home of having a relationship with Max. Yeah. And that's why we see her alone. And then, at the very end, we get to see Flint come to to a to home. A home. Yep. <sighs> yep. So it's very interesting that she's alone, drinking alone with the Sky Boat song, mm-hmm. while he is coming to a home that we've not seen before. Oh God! Right. This we scene was so important to me. I'll boil some water. Yes. Mm. Hello, Miranda. Mm-hmm. I think of her a lot. It's impossible not mm-hmm. to, honestly. Uh, I just actually re-listened to our episode with Louise Barnes about Miranda. I have to do that soon. That, oh, that my was, God. It's such a good episode. <laughs> so, I was just, I'm so was moving. Incredible conversation. Yes. Yep. Ah. Uh, beautiful. Yeah. This episode is incredible. Yeah, that, oh God, him sinking. I down love episode door. one. It's so but, good. But just like just like the way that we that we liked Vane's introduction here and we liked Eleanor's introduction here, mm-hmm. I feel like in a lot of ways this episode introduces the show. Like the first oh, episode obviously sure. introduces the show, mm-hmm. but I feel like the first episode was a lot about saying, Hey, this is what you think pirates are and let's subvert that. Mm-hmm. And this is the episode that actually says, okay, well now that we've subverted that, let's get into what this story is actually yeah. about. No, that's a great point. Um, I find it. Yeah. This episode is just phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> No, it, made, it really for moves me. me. We'll, we'll do um, episode three soon, but it it's one of the things that made season three so difficult for me is because season three went in direction I was not wanting, I suppose. Um, but this episode season three or episode three? Episode three. Oh, sorry, you said season. Oh, I'm three. so sorry. Okay. Yeah, episode three. Yeah. Um. But oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um. And I was just so tired of all of the. Rape, basically. On TV, I was so mm-hmm. tired. And so mm-hmm. it almost was enough to make me say, forget it. I'm just, here's another one yeah. that I'm just not going to watch. But this you episode are not alone in that. so strong that mm-hmm. I had to say it through. All right. So shall I bring in our question from Elena? Yeah. Yeah. Please do. Elena asked, this is so, this is such a great question. She asked, I've always been curious about Flint's thoughts during this scene, just because I posted the scene about, about uh, when Max realizes mm-hmm. that Eleanor has betrayed her and says, you know, this place is only sand. It can't love you back. So she said, I've always been curious about Flint's thoughts during this scene. I mean, Flint shows up right after that, but when, when Eleanor is, demanding the schedule from Max in front of Flint and Gates. Mm -hmm. Was he surprised by their relationship? What would he have done if faced with the same decision? I'm going to just say now, super spoilers, just with Thomas or Miranda. So I think this is a really interesting question because Flint, obviously, again, I really believe that the conversation that Flint has with Eleanor is partly his very intentional practice story yeah that he does but also i do think i do feel like there's a moment where flint loses his intentional self and becomes his flint self Mm. when he does the odysseus part and Uh that's what actually moves eleanor but it is an interesting question like he watches then eleanor betray 
her romantic relationship for the sake of the dream and would how would flint do that like how is flint seeing eleanor's behavior there because i think one could argue that you know flint wouldn't have chosen a dream over thomas it's kind of an impossible question because we find out you know over time that the dream is completely tied up with flint's feelings about thomas mm -hmm. Um, but it is interesting. Like, who does Flint see when he sees Eleanor do that? What do you mean, who does he see? Not who does he see, but like, what does he see? Like, does he see a person that is behaving the way he would behave? Or is he seeing a person who is... I think that is... even at this point, Flint has become quite maniacal. Like, he, he is mm -hmm. manic. He... I, I just don't think thinks very much about Eleanor. Um, yeah, that's very possible. And so e even though he's very sincere in this moment, even though he does get lost in himself, it's only because mm -hmm. what is true happens to serve his purpose right now. But if it didn't, he would just say something different. Like he's right. not trying to connect emotionally with Eleanor. He just... He just happened to, to connect. Yeah. And, and right. so he does use that to his, to his advantage. But... I don't think that, like, is the question basically like if he knew what it was going to cost Eleanor his relationship with Matt, with her relationship with no, Max? No, it's he... just like, I think the question is based on the idea of like Flint still being, some part of Flint still being James, like what yeah. we call James McGraw. Right. And, w you know, if James McGraw was watching Eleanor basically break Max for the sake of the dream, mm -hmm. how would James, like, would James McGraw see that as something he re he could relate to or something that was completely impossible for him to relate to? Oh, yeah. I think that's the question. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other question is a very interesting thing, and I have a whole thing I'm working on about, like, when Flint... I do think there's, like, this interesting break between when Flint is deliberately being a storyteller to influence people. Like, we definitely see that in episode one when he's talking to Billy in the little skiff when he's trying to convince him that, you know, about England, England is coming for us and, right. you know, and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, when a, you know, when a King brands you as monsters, all of the, all of that storyline, yes. that's Flint doing his deliberate storytelling. I think there's something more elemental about Flint where he ends up being a force that inspires other people to take certain mm. actions that may not be a hundred percent intentional on his point on his part. Like I do think there's some aspect of Flint throughout the story in all four seasons where he becomes, um, this interesting catalyst. I was going to say it's interesting not... considering the name Flint. Right. Yeah. It is so true mm -hmm. that he sparks, he sparks things, things in other people. Yeah. Um, that he, beca that there is a side of him that is like silver, that is the in an intentional storyteller for the sake of, of moving people in the direction he needs. Mm. But there's this other side of Flint where he has this more catalytic aspect to yeah. himself that he's not a hundred percent in control of. But we see throughout there. We, I mean, I brought this up in the podcast many times that there's moments where Flint, says something that that reaches down kind of into the essential conflict right. within another person to motivate them in a way but I don't think it's necessarily intentional it, there's just something about flint that makes other people make choices so yeah. that's one aspect of it uh -huh. but I think what Elena's asking about is the idea of like the James McGraw with the relationships he's had and the story he's had, would he be able to relate to a person choosing a dream over a relationship? And I think the question is like, that is a real Flint McGraw thing because I think Flint, we were about to see that Flint actually does do that to Miranda, even though he doesn't need, he's never forced into a position where he has to choose the dream or Miranda. He chooses the dream over Miranda. Yeah. But with Thomas, like James McGraw 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any, personally, I don't think there's any way that James McGraw would choose an abstract dream over the reality of Thomas. 
Right. Well, and again, Thomas was so, I think, I think you hit on it earlier when you said that Thomas was so tied up to that dream. Exactly. That it's really hard to make that distinction. Like they were one in the same sort of, that was part of what compelled the two of them towards each other, I suppose. Although I think personally, I think that, that James McGraw chose the dream because he chose Thomas. Yes. I think that ultimately he began to believe in the dream. But I think that the dream came out of his love for Thomas right. or yeah, his, his adoption the conclusion himself, right. or even if exactly. even somebody else, um, with the same, same ideals, like his love for Thomas was really tied right. to that. But that's an interesting, like essential difference between whatever version of James you're talking about mm-hmm. and Eleanor is because, Uh, James came to the dream through his ability to be vulnerable and have a relationship. And Eleanor came to the dream because she, because of her own traumas and her own experience Mm -hmm. of abandonment must choose a dream that leads to some sort of security outside of herself rather than something relational, which would make her depend on her internal self. Mm. And I don't think that Eleanor is capable of that. Right. Certainly not yet. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. Eleanor at this stage is so, is so traumatized by the concept and the experience of abandonment that she has to look for her security in something outside of herself. Yeah. And outside of people even. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Something more abstract, something more physical that she needs to find it that in this concept of what Nassau can become. Mm. Whereas Max is someone who's looking for something that's based in internal things like a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's lovely. Um, So yeah, that's, that's where I came down on that. Um, God, these people are just, they're just, I love these characters so much. They're so, they're so palpable. They're just they like, are. they're so yeah. real feeling. There's so many ways to like, they just, they hold up so well. Like you can, you can be asked them, you know, all of these questions about them yeah. and look at them and they just, there's just so many characters in the world that's like, you look at them and they're like, yeah, this is this. Like I can right. pigeonhole Very these people. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And even if they feel temporarily three-dimensional, like when you really spend time with a lot of fictional characters, they even they don't necessarily read as two-dimensional initially, but they somehow become two-dimensional when you really try to like analyze right. them. And yeah, it kind of falls apart. Sure. Or- exactly. Exactly. Or become flattened. Yeah. You're like they flatten themselves under scrutiny. Mm. And I feel mm-hmm. like these characters under scrutiny only become Fuller and more richer. multifaceted. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. No. Which is incredible. It makes other TV hard to watch. I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. It's so true. <laughs> I'm trying very hard. <laughs> Yes. You know what I'm watching right now? What's that? I am re-watching The West Wing, which you must watch. Okay. I watched the pilot and I loved it and was sold. So I should. Okay. That Mm -hmm. legit, that is my favorite pilot in the world. Excellent pilot. Right? Uh Nope. It absolutely was. Yep. It absolutely was. Yeah. Watch the whole, watch two seasons at the very least. Like, I think that. I feel like there, I don't remember if I feel like it's like two or three seasons that are like incredible and then it's like still very, very good. But unlike Black Sails, it's a show that actually does get less good over time. Yeah. Yeah. But so many of them the do. first season is just phenomenal. I've just been watching it while I work the past few okay. days and I'm just like, oh my God, this show. Okay. I it's just, that. it's lyrical. Yes. Like that, yes. that speech, that yes. speech that Jed Bartlett gives at the end of the, yeah. fir- of the pilot. What was it? Something through just, a storm they came. I don't remember what it was. With nothing but the clothes be, in their backs or something. I don't know. Just be prepared. Like they're just like a shitload of stuff like that where you're just like, I don't know why I'm so engaged with yeah. this. I should be bored and I'm so engaged. Okay. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful show. That's fabulous. But yes, mm-hmm. I, I, <laughs> There are very few shows that hold up to black it's sales. It's true. No, I just watched the, the West Wing might be one of them. Breaking Bad, and I was like, eh. 
<laughs> I know Ray likes it a whole lot, but it just didn't. No, Breaking Breaking Bad is not my no, show. Sorry, yeah, listeners was, who love Breaking Bad is so not, not my me. show. Uh, yeah. Wanderlust, I enjoyed. I watched that recently with Tony Collette, and of course, Tony mm-hmm. Collette can do no wrong. Oh, I've been meaning so, to watch that. It's weirdly orange. They decided to do this thing to make all the colors very warm, <laughs> which I get. Okay, but it is. It is like everybody in the cast had a losing battle with tanning lotion. It's really strange. <laughs> and it's distracting sometimes. But okay, beyond I'm that, quite that. lovely. All right. Yes, I am going to try that. Dude. But yes, mm-hmm. Black Sails. Um, yeah. Again, I mean, I feel like, you know, we, we're two years or more than two years into this. And the hilarious thing is like back when we started podcasting, I was like, I'm yet to get to a, a rewatch of this show where I don't learn new yeah. things and it doesn't get deeper for me. I'm still there. Oh, wow. Like I am writing about this show right now uh-huh. and I'm like watching it over and over again, again, <laughs> like I'm going through the process again of watching episodes yeah. over and over again and I'm still learning new shit. That's wonderful. It's amazing. Mm. It's amazing. Mm. Expertly done. All right, but um, now we should wrap up. It's time to wrap things up, I think, yes. It is. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we're going to, in some some time within the next month, we're going to do another one of these. And um, thank you to our patrons. Thank you so much for being our patrons. Yes, thank you. God, yes, thank you. Literally helping put me through college. So thank you. Yep, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) And uh, we, this is this is a great. I mean, this is just fun. This is hopefully mm-hmm. fun for you all. It's certainly fun for us, and we're gonna do the whole damn thing. Yes, we are. And we have some guests booked loosely, so we don't know yet when they're gonna mm-hmm. come and for which episodes. But we do have some fun guests that we'll do this with, um, and it's really fun for us. This is neat. It's really fun to revisit this show after after podcasting and after all of our interviews and insights and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's neat. Yep, it's been a blast. And so until the next round from Common Room Radio, I'm Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag FathomsDeep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening.